Hi, I'm Ariane, and today we're going to make some 18th century pockets. Now, unlike the pockets that you're probably more familiar with, these pockets are not attached to any garment. They're not hanging on your skirt or anything. They are worn on a tape that's tied around your waist and you wear them between two layers of petticoats or between a petticoat and your apron and they're not actually going to be quite this size once they're finished because of course we have seam allowance here but they are still pretty substantial now to do this project you're going to need your pattern which is pretty basic. This is about 48 centimeters by... Uh, this pattern is 34 centimeters by 48. So very substantial. You don't have to stuff it full of things in order to have everything in there. In fact, the last time I made pockets like this, I had little pockets inside so I could keep my phone separate from my tissues, separate from my pens, and everything. Now, before we get too involved in what we're going to make, let me show you the book that I got this from. It is called Rural Pennsylvania Clothing, and it's written by Ellen Garrett in 1976, you know, for the 200th anniversary of the United States. What we're going to make today is a very simple pocket that she has lots of examples of. Some of them are embroidered, some of them are made with cotton, some of them are patchwork. Most of them are linen and mine's going to be linen because I have a lot more linen than cotton and I like it a lot better. It's also something that was far more widely used in the 18th century than cotton was. Now, the tapes that you use to hang your pocket from your waist would be made from linen cords woven into a tape. They tended to be two color, like blue and white, blue and brown. Blue was very popular. <laughs> They sometimes use red, but not so much. Um, tended to be a dyed color and a natural color, like white, off-white, or brown. So basically they got as much impact as they could from the dyed color. Today, instead, you can use simple cotton tape that you buy at Joann's or your local fabric store. I've got basic white here that came on a spool and I've got a nicely patterned blue one that came on a larger spool that I had to have a length cut off of it. Basically I bought the entire length. And just like them, but a little bit less desperately, we are going to try to get as much out of the fabric that we have as possible. Back then, pretty much all the fabric that you bought was hand spun, hand dyed, hand woven, hand processed. This was something that you would be rather careful about waste. Now, it might not be any of those, but it also costs a little bit of money, so you maybe don't want to throw away half your yardage. I think this is where I want to cut this one out, like my fabric weights. I've tried using other ways. Honestly, I would rather use candles. I 
quite often. I just mark it with sidewalk chalk that I bought in the toy department at my local Walmart. I prefer not to poke holes in my patterns because once you do that, that's a weak spot where your pattern is likely to tear. So I just try to avoid pinning my pattern to my fabric as much as possible. I'll do that where it matters, like on a coat party. Here, I can get what I need without doing that. this part again, but that's where I'm slitting it to. started hitting the fabric just on the other side of the pattern. This is such a simple design that I wouldn't really need the pattern at all. And they probably didn't bother making a pattern for it. It's just handy to have something that you can throw on a scrap of fabric and go, ah, yes, this is big enough, or, oops, no, not quite. <laughs> Unfortunately, that oops, no, not quite happened a lot when I was deciding today what fabric to use for the inner part. Now I'm going to cut off this fringy bit here because I don't want that to get in the way of cutting out the next layers. Because at this point I'm not going to use the pattern, I'm going to use this layer of the pocket. going to need two layers of this beautiful blue linen, one for the front of each of my two pockets, and then I'm going to decide which of these linens, or possibly that one, I'm going to use for the inner front and the back. And you want to stay on a grain line. because that way your pocket will not stretch any more than you want it to. Since the pockets weren't generally seen, the fact that so many of them were embroidered or otherwise decorated seems to be a way that the ladies personalized their pockets. So now we have 
two layers cut out the fronts of both pockets. And we just need to decide which fabric to use for the inside and the back of the two pockets. Now, my first thought was to use this fabric. It's almost the same shade, but a little more subdued. Maybe like this was the first dyeing and this was the second or third. I have two layers here, which is enough for the second layer of two pockets. This will easily do two, possibly four layers. This is silk, so we'll maybe skip that. Save that for something else like lining the hood. This is a desperation idea. It's not even real cotton. We'll try to avoid using that. This is another linen. This would make three. So I have two good options. I can use this linen and this linen. One is the inside layer and one is the back layer. Or I can make all four, possibly, out of this one. Easy to check on that. I can tell just looking at it that there's room for four. Actually do something else with it and pockets tended to be made out of scrap material. So I am leaning toward those two. Always before you cut make sure that everything is actually where you need it. Not such a big deal when you're working on a scrap, but if you're cutting into $20, $30 yard silk, you might save yourself a few gray hairs if you check two or three times. pieces cut out. We just need to unpin them and pin them together correctly so I can sew them. Of course historically all the sewing would have been done by hand. But I might move things a little bit faster and use a sewing machine. This layer will be a closer match to this layer. 
so that means that I need to take this and one of these and put them together. And you want to be very careful that all your major points line up even though you're not actually sewing there. Get those major points lined up. Now our next step is going to be getting out the sewing machine and sewing the slit. So I'm going to turn off the camera and see you momentarily. And now we have finished sewing that first seam on our pockets. So we can cut down this line here and make them open up. I used a 2 eighths inch seam allowance. So that this seam wouldn't try to come out, but would be about as tight as it could be without having that issue. And when you're doing something like this, you always want to sew it first and then cut it open because otherwise you're rolling the dice. Now that we've cut that, I can flip it over and finger press it. 
have a nice clean opening. I'm going to top stitch along this opening, but I will probably do that part by hand since it's so visible. I'm also going to sew around the edge all the way around, but I'm going to use the machine on that because it's not going to be seen at all by anyone once I finish sewing this, and the machine is a lot quicker, <laughs> even against me. If I want my top stitching to be a little decorative, I can use a contrasting color of thread. That's probably how we developed the idea of doing embroidery. It's not a huge step from using a contrasting color of thread to, oh, let me make something a little more creative than it absolutely has to be. I know you're not supposed to put your pins in your mouth, but habit. I suppose I should try to be a good example. Cutting your pockets separately from your skirt used to be a very handy idea because back when these pockets were being used, you know, men had pockets in their breeches, of course, but a woman's pocket was more like a woman's purse. You didn't have to transfer things from the pockets of one skirt to the pockets of another. You just put the same pocket on and you had everything that you needed. Men couldn't exactly do that. And now I have two pocket fronts that I'm ready to do some top stitching around the outside. And of course the reason for doing the top stitching around the outside is so that both of these layers move as one when I'm ready to sew them to this layer. So we'll see you in a few moments. So we have top stitched around the outside of both of these. So we are ready to sew them back of the pocket. And since this is our outside, we need to flip it like that.
so this is entirely pinned together and I can set that over there get this one done so we have sewn our front and back together leaving a little bit at the top here so I can fold this down and make a casing for the tape but before I do that, I want to cut down my edge just a bit. My seam allowance is currently 3 eighths of an inch. I think 2 eighths or 1 quarter will be more appropriate for what I want to do. Now what I'm going to do with both of these is turn them right side out. And I could either make a casing around the outer edge or just top stitch it. I think I'm just going to top stitch it. So basically, I will just roll the edges a bit till the seam is right there in the center and then I'll pin it. So I'm going to do the top stitching by hand because top stitching is very visible and I don't want that visible stitch to be machine sewn. Which probably means that I'm going to be finishing this off tomorrow instead of later today. But, this is a small project, it's actually possible that I could finish it today. When I worked in St. Augustine, I used my pockets more often than I used a purse, even with modern clothes. I decided to use the matching color instead of a contrasting one for my top stitching. Just like that better. stitches and then pull it and do a back stitch. That way it's nice and secure and isn't going to come out on me. you could say that I am. And right there we want some extra reinforcement. So instead of doing three running stitches and then a back stitch, I'm going to just do back stitch, back stitch, back stitch. 
It'll be slower, but it'll be stronger. And now we're back to the sides where I can do three running stitches and a back stitch. See, even though this is handwork, it's still going very quickly. Part of that's because it's small, and part of that's because handwork isn't as slow as you think it is. And now we're ready to make a knot, which if you haven't done that before, a matter of small stitch someplace inconspicuous taking a loop just before you finish pulling it all the way through put your needle through that loop and pull the loop till it's gone now you've got another loop put your needle through there Make it go away. And three loops is generally enough. So we're going to put the needle through one last time and just pull that till it's gone. We're going to make a knot, pinch the thread between your finger and your pinky, wrap it around once, now roll it off, and generally with your long finger, keep the knot from going while you pull it. stitch on the inside someplace inconspicuous to lock that knot in place just in case. And as we go around the outside instead of going one millimeter from the folded edge I'm going about three Basically, I'm going just to the inside of the raw edge from the last one. Basically, I'm making a French seam, but not folding the casing to the inside. I don't really care if you see it underneath all my skirts. I am almost to the end. When I get up to this pin, I need to make a knot. At that point, I will be done with this pocket, aside from sewing it to the tape. Up. 
You always want to put your knot on the inside whenever possible because that way, even if you don't care that it would be visible, it's going to have less wear and tear on it. Which means your knot will last longer and you won't have stitches to redo. So that one's ready for the tape. And this one... This one is ready for a new length of thread. Making the knot again, just rolling it off my finger, catching it with my other nail, pulling till it's not gone. Indigo was a very popular dye in the 18th century. It was basically the newer, better version of wood. And both the blues here, in fact all three of the blues here, are ones that could be achieved with indigo. This one will be one or two dips in the dye bath. This one would be exactly but as many as you can afford and this would be probably about as many dips in a slightly exhausted dye bath indigo and woad which both of which are chemically pretty much the same they're both the active ingredient in the dyes indigotten anyway the Indigotten is one of the coolest dyes you will ever use because most dyes, when you stick fiber in the dye bath, the fiber soaks up the dye, it gets that color, and it is that color. Indigotten, your fiber soaks up the color, but it doesn't turn blue until it comes out of the dye bath and the oxygen hits it. And if you dip something in indigotin, you can watch it turn blue as you pull it out and the water leaves the fabric and the oxygen hits it and it just turns from green to blue right before your eyes. And at first it's a lighter shade of blue and then you dip it in again and it gets a darker shade and you dip it in again and again till it hits the shade that you want and at that point you finish it off you hang it up to dry and you have this beautiful blue garment or whatever Now, people have been dying with wood in Europe since before the Romans came to Gaul. And for most, if not all of that time, wood, which was what you got the blue from, was one of the more expensive dyes. To have a more expensive dye, you'd have to be killing snails in the Mediterranean. Since before the Romans came to what is now France, French wood was the best. If you had the money, you paid a merchant shipping, and at that point shipping meant walking or riding your cart loaded with these little balls of probably not very good smelling wood all the way from France to wherever you were. And yes, 
yes, the markup was extreme. Between the middleman and the fact that the king wanted his share, and all the local lords who charged their own tolls, but it was worth it. No matter where you lived, French Road was the best, and it was what you wanted if you could afford it. Aside from those snails, or mollusks, I think. Aside from those mollusks in the Mediterranean that were basically being killed to make purple, aside from them, woad and matter were the best colors, which is why everybody's flag has blue and red on it. Wood you could grow anywhere, but the French wood was best. Matter, if there was a geographical difference, I'm not aware of it. And yes, wood is the same thing that those picks up in Scotland used to paint themselves all over. And they want it to be beautiful. And then the 18th century came around and somebody discovered that wood wasn't the only thing that made this beautiful blue color. This weird little plant in the West Indies made pretty much the same thing. And my understanding is that it was at least a little bit easier to process. And now everybody could make their own dye that was as beautiful blue as the French wood. to the bottom of the split. So I'm about to start doing just back stitches all the way around it. And what I remember of the story of how we got indigo. There was this lady in South Carolina named Eliza Lucas. And her brother was, I think in Barbados, somewhere in the West Indies. And he sent her a slip of indigo. A slip is like a little bit more than a seedling. probably sent more than one just in case they died, but in the history he sent her a slip of indigo. And she planted it, and it grew, and it flowered. Beautiful, by the way. And she processed it, which presumably he had sent her to the directions. And she discovered, oh wow, this really is a great dye. Soon indigo was one of the major crops that were being grown in South Carolina and any place else that had about the right conditions. And of course the English loved this idea because, you know, they had been spending lots of money on French woad for over a thousand years. And now, England, which had these colonies in the Americas, could grow its own beautiful blue dye. And they were very, very glad of this because, you know, economic realities. And 
that's one of the reasons why you see so many pictures of people in some shade of blue in the 18th century. Because suddenly, hello. Yes. Suddenly blue dyes became something that it was not only affordable to use, but patriotic to use. And people appreciate that. So I'm about to start sewing the outside of the second pocket. And I thought I would show you that knot again, because repetition is the key to learning. I have pinched the end between my finger and thumb, wrap it around once, roll it off my finger onto my thumb, catch it with my tall fingernail, pull till it stops and now we're secure. I only have that much more to go. Last one. Away. Pull it till it goes away. Nail through the next loop. And one more time through the loop and make it go away. my pockets to my tape. I'm going to decide which end of the tape is the inside and I'm going to hem it up. Just a nice neat little hem. I'm going to find the center. Now, there was no one true way to do these. In the book she gives five different examples and that's just from the extant pockets. There was also no one true way to tie it. In some of the examples she is pretty sure that they got tied off to the side because one end of the tape is much longer than the other. In some of them, 
she's pretty sure that they tied in the middle because they're apparently the same length. And some of them she doesn't guess. So, I made mine long enough that if for some reason I don't tie it in the back, it's still going to work. Basically what I'm doing is I'm folding over the back layer. I should probably pin it, it'll stay more easily. over the front to the same amount. I put the tape inside that folded over X section. That part's pinned. And we're going to keep it even across the back. But there's going to be a gap in the front because we had seam allowances. So I line everything up and repin it there. That pocket is entirely pinned in place. Now I just need to do the other one and then sew them. They're pinned in place. I'm going to whip stitch across the top to make sure that there aren't any edges catching. It's just smoother than top stitching. And then I'm going to top stitch on the sides and across the bottom. Right now I'm just hiding my knot, which is easier to do if you come at it from this side. Now I've gotten halfway across one of the two fronts and I've decided that I'm going to go down this side here and go across and go up before I go on to the next one. So right now at the corner I'm taking a couple stitches in the same exact place. That makes it nice and strong. So I did a hem stitch on this little bit right here. Basically a hem stitch is the same as a whip stitch, only you're going through a little bit of fabric on the other side. And now I am going across here, and for that I'm doing top stitch. Running stitch with back stitch every time I pull the needle through. And I'm making sure while I'm doing this that I'm sewing through all the layers, including through the tape. 
I'm not making a casing, I'm sewing the actual tape. That means that it will be more secure. And then up the side. One last stitch straight through. easy if you haven't done it before. Basically you're just wrapping the thread around the edge of the fabric and pushing the needle through it at a slight angle. Whip stitch is good for securing that finished edge and keeping it from unfolding, unrolling, whatever you did to it because with the thread going through it, obviously, it can't unroll. I've done super fine 14th century veils with basically the same stitch. I've done coarse, quick sewing. It works for them all. And now back to top stitching along this bottom edge. extra stitches at the top before I start whip stitching again. And a couple stitches all in the same place at this end. across the bottom of the tape just to have that nice and secure all the way across. Ready for another knot. across the top for our last section. I am doing all those stitches in the corner that are all in the same place. And then down the side.
top stitching across the bottom and all I'll need to do is hem the ends of my tape. Just making a quick hem at the end of my tape so that it doesn't unravel. Unraveling is unsightly today and back in the 18th century it meant that somebody's hard work was going away. That's one end done. show you what my newly finished pockets look like with the underpinnings, at least most of them. I should be wearing a set of stays right now, but my only corset currently is a 16th century one with entirely the wrong silhouette. So for right now, I'm just wearing my shift, which is a medium heavy linen, but very soft, and my under petticoat, which is a medium weight linen. So here we have the pockets. They're big, they're blue, they're on a navy blue tape instead of the one that I originally sewed them on to, because while I was attaching them to that tape, I went on joannes.com to find the tape that I prefer using. And I found that they didn't have any for sale on their website. So rather than using up the last of what I have on something that isn't going to show, I replaced it with this slightly heavier navy blue tape that will work just fine. And they get tied on just like this, one over each of the side slits in your petticoat. Now, I said that the pockets would still be completely accessible, even once you're fully dressed. And for that, I'm going to show you a magic trick. Now, here's my petticoat. It only has one tie because back when I made it, I didn't know that some of them could have one on each side. So with this petticoat, this pocket's going to be inaccessible, but most of the time I'll have petticoats on that have a tie on each side and an opening on each side so I can get to this one too. before, this outfit will give you curves, especially once you have your stays on. And so this part right here looks flat. There we go. So stay tuned. And we will be making veils and stays and lots of other fun projects. See you next time! <laughs>